Hello, everyone. Welcome to The Crownsman Show. I'm your host, Jared Downey. We have today a guest that I, I've been wanting to feature K-Line trailers for a long time. Um, I, I visited their facility quite a few years ago, and it was, it was amazing at the time, and they've done more projects since. So I'm very excited to have Rob Weeb, their general manager, on the show. Um, welcome to the show, Rob. Thank you, Jared. Pleasure to be here today. Oh, we're going to cover some great projects that you've done. We're actually going to look inside uh, your facilities. Um, so it's going to be an exciting show. But first, I need to bring in Gaudi Molina. Not need to, want to. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, Gaudi. Um, how are you today? I am doing very well. Good. Um, this show is made possible. I sound like one of those old uh, radio announcers. This show is made possible by... Um, <laughs> But no, we have some great sponsors. Do we have any new sponsors on? Or are these we, the... We do have a couple new sponsors. Um, I will just... Start. We actually have quite a few. Oh. <laughs> yeah. You're, po so you're popular, Rob. So first up, actually, a new sponsor is KG Industries. KG Industries specializes in manufacturing specialty um, heavy-duty axles. If you need self-steer for steer or off-highway axles, um, they work with companies on engineering axles for their specific <laughs> needs. KGI's axles are built to outlast the service life of the equipment. They are used on with designs that make the axles easy to service. Whether you are moving mining equipment, cranes, or even rockets, KGI will help you perfect the design. You can visit them at kgi.ca to learn more. Once again, that is kgi.ca. And next up, we have Cal Tire Mining Tire Group. Whatever your goals, reducing costs, improving uptime, or fulfilling sustainability commitments, Cal Tire's Mining Tire Group has proven solutions to help you reach your targets. With proactive planning, tire management innovation, and highly trained team members, at Cal Tire, they believe you can expect more at every stage of a tire's life. To learn more, please visit caltiremining.com or email them at info at caltire.com. And then we have Bellatorum Resources. Bellatorum Resources is a veteran owned and operated investment firm specializing in mineral rights acquisitions, leasing and right of way services, curative title work, as well as other consulting services. Their leadership team is highly experienced in providing all services asso associated with major projects in the energy industry. You can find out more at bellatorum.com. And of course, we also have Savanaugh Equipment. Savanaugh Equipment supplies new and used mining equipment around the world from plaster to underground to ore processing plants. They have gold concentrating tables, trommels, and mineral jigs in stock now to take advantage of the high gold prices. You can visit them at SavanaughEquipment.com to view their entire inventory and see more equipment every day. And last but not least, we have Power Zone Equipment. When you need a specialized team of world-class engineers for your oil and gas pipelines, watering or any fluid handling needs, you want to visit powerzone.com. In addition to their inventory of rebuilt pumps, motors, engines, they also have an amazing team to design and engineer your systems, no matter the challenge, no matter the location. Get in the zone with PowerZone. Visit them at powerzone.com. There we go. Thank you to all of our sponsors. <laughs> I noticed a bit of a theme in the first couple sponsors. <laughs> <laughs> um, the uh, actually the KG Industries. There's some interesting stuff there. The relationship between K Line Trailers and KGI. We're going to get into that uh, later on the show, Rob. But uh, let's start off the show um, with um, let's just talk about let's talk about the main product lines because uh, I know I mean K Line. A lot of people know it. They they build customized trailers so but let's talk about sort of the, the bread and butter of the company those you know maybe like top three products um, that you're you're manufacturing sounds good Jared we break our product line into three main categories as you mentioned the first category I'll just breeze through them quickly and then we can do more detail uh, the first category is the dump product so that's the the gravel trucks you see on the road uh, especially in the lower mainland of BC here that's what we're known for those uh, aluminum dump trucks We've also got side dumps. You can see on the wall behind me a, a big side dump we built uh, for a northern uh, customer. We've got various different types of dump products. The second type of product we, we feature is the low beds. Um, everybody's familiar with low beds moving machinery. Uh, we start these at about 40 tons, your typical tritum low bed, and we'll go right up to 85 tons, a big 13 multi-axle low bed. 
the third and other broad category is the specialized. So that's kind of the extra things, the, the, the super hull, the, the big trailers, windmill trailers, those sort of things that are a little bit bigger than a low bed. The, I, what, the, one of the reasons I was excited to have you on the show, Rob, um, you in particular, is because you, uh, you don't just come from a management, um, you come from the engineering side of actually making these trailers. So I, I do want, a lot of times we get into it at the end of the show, but I wanted to sort of set up so the audience, because we are going to talk yeah. about the process of building these trailers, which is, is quite interesting. Um, and so where, where, what's sort of your journey through the company at K-Line? Good question. And that's a question I love to answer. So before uh, you mentioned I was engineering manager, but I'm going to back up a step before that. Before I went to engineering school, I was actually a truck driver for about nine years. Oh. So I was in that industry at that level and just enjoyed every minute of driving truck. And at some point, you know, I wanted to be home for supper a little more often. And I transitioned to university, got an engineering degree and was looking for a job. And when I drove around and I rolled into K-Line's parking lot, I said, this is where I want to work. And I basically harassed them until they hired me here. And uh, it was either uh, put a restraining order on or hire me. And uh, that was 2003. Uh, a few years after that, I was asked to be the engineering manager, I, a role which I absolutely loved. It was the all-encompassing role. I'd get to work with the customers, you know, work on the sale, build that relationship with the customer, and then see the design come to life and eventually to hit the highway and even sometimes be able to test drive them which was a highlight so that was my journey uh 2018 i was approached by the management here and they asked me if i would uh, assume the general manager role and so that's my my quick journey through k-line um i got, I got to clarify a couple of things because you how long were you do uh you you were so you were a truck driver and then you you took did, did you take like four years off to become an engineer that's right. Yeah, I sort of worked the engineering in amongst the truck driving first year oh. with my correspondence. And uh, yeah, so it was done over a few, a few year period there. That, that's quite that's quite interesting. So I just I think of engineering, a lot of people come straight out of high school and they go into that. So you actually you actually went to work for a few years and then, okay. and then jumped into it. Yeah. Um, K-Line, is there an industry, I mean, I, I know with transportation, we sort of always run into this, whether it's a crane company or you saw like KGI with like axles, it, it, it spans across industries. Are there a few industry, industries like the aggregates and, and things like that, that's sort of that primary driver, or is it pretty evenly distributed through multiple industries? I think the dump industry is what we would say is our primary, our bread and butter industry here at K-Line. And we build hundreds of, uh, we call them transfer trailers, is the main product we build. That's our, the, the main product. So the dump industry, uh, the aluminum gravel truck industry. The, the thing with K-Line is, um, and actually, to be honest, I didn't understand this. Um, I, I knew there was a, a huge customized component to everything you did. I didn't realize, I thought there was sort of some standard lines though, but pretty much everything you put out is custom. Is that right? That's correct, Jared. We build very little, if any, stock trailers. We get the order and we're building that custom trailer for the, the customer. And to me, that's really the joy of what we do. We're not running an assembly line, not running a, you know, a big production factory. It's more about building these one-off trailers or sometimes there's multiples, but it's always tailored just for that customer and for their needs. And that's the fun of it. Every customer's got a unique slant on what they want. And you think you've done it all and then you know you talk to the next customer and there's a new avenue they want to explore maybe a little more payload a little more flexibility in the design a little more user features so it's just like i compare it to building homes you know we've we're building different homes every day there's a different floor plan there's no one size fits all and i think trailers are the same you know there are trailers you can buy that are built in an assembly line and they probably do things fairly well but they're not going to be just exactly right for your needs. And that's where we come in. I want to, I just, just so I get the name right, what, what, what did you say is that main, the aluminum uh, dump? What, what is that? What do you call that? We call it a transfer, transfer truck and trailer. And it's a unique to the West Coast, mainly in the West Coast. And I can back up way up and discuss last night, actually started L. Knight and Company in 1967. 
And Les Knight, who is the owner of K-Line, I know we're covering a lot of ground. No, he, that's, not, that's what the show's for. <laughs> he, he, he developed the, uh, the transfer trailer in the 60s at L. Knight and Company. And when K-Line started in 1994, we continued that transfer trailer line. Now, the idea of a transfer truck and trailer, to anyone who's not familiar to seeing them, is we actually back the truck up to the trailer, and you can transfer that trailer box into the truck. And that gives the user great flexibility. He can take that full payload and you know back it down an alley, down a steep hill, and dump and deliver that load in places that a standard four axle wagon type trailer, you just couldn't get it in there. That truck really gives great flexibility, and especially in the city, uh, Vancouver, Seattle, the West Coast area here. Mm. What the, something I was trying to understand um, when you were saying that each one. So these now, what is the what is the customized component? Like, what are some examples of um, if you've got ten customers lined up that ne need those? What is it? Is it capacity requirements? Um, is it is it uh, what would be what would make one different from the other? On the transfer truck and trailer side, it's not as varied as the low bed or the specialty side. Oh. So they're similar design. Where the customization comes in is typically in the looks and some of the, uh, the accessories. Mm -hmm. Each customer is gonna wanna have his unique look and we get into you know, paint schemes and lighting configurations and there are options as well. But it does tend more toward the appearance on the transfer trailers is what uh, makes it custom. Yeah, well, I mean, I've seen a lot of k I, <laughs> I should stress this, a lot of those trailers around Vancouver. I mean, do you have any idea, I don't want to put you on the spot, do you have any idea how many there are in the lower mainland of, alone? Is, do you have be, any idea? It'd be thousands, I would say. We build about 150 units per year, and that's been going on since K-Line started in 1994. That's, that's, well, I swear, every time that I'm uh, stuck on, you know, when they, you have to cross a train track and you're stuck behind the slowest truck in the world, Sorry. Um, that is, it's always K-Line. Yes. <laughs> so it's great advertising. Um, let's, let's talk about the low beds. Um, that is, um, I mean, it's, it's also a major part of your business. Um, what is the process of going into these specialized, these low beds? Because now you're talking about, I mean, you're, these are either hauling a, a wide variety of, of heavy hauls, or you're talking about having to transport something very specific. Can you talk about that process? Because for me, you know, and, and probably for a lot of people watching, we've all seen these crazy loads going down the highway and you're thinking, like, how did they even pull that off? Or how'd they get permits for that? And wow. so can you talk about that process of, um, uh, of what it takes to put those together? Absolutely, I'd love to. Uh, as I mentioned, I actually drove before K-Line and I was a low bed operator. Oh. So that's the fun for me is working on the low beds and working with the customer. The process typically starts with sales as, as most, you know, does, most of these things happen with a company. You, you phone in and talk to either a salesman here at K-Line or one of our dealers. From there, we'll work on what we call a sales drawing. So we'll put together the layout on, on paper, on CAD, and give you an idea, you know, what's this gonna look like? What's it gonna weigh? What you're gonna be able to haul for, for payload? Then we'll get into the spec, we'll write up the, uh, the, the specifications, figure out the pricing and work out the deal with the customer. Once the agreements are done, then we really get to work here. And engineering will start and we'll take that, that sales drawing, as we call it, and turn it into production drawings. And that can take sometimes a fair amount of time. On a very custom project like these ones featured on the wall behind me, this can take months to go through the design from this initial sales drawing to the detailed shop drawings. Once that's done, then it's time for engineering to pass it off to the production team in the shop. And we have a full fabrication production facility here at K-Line. We've got uh, over 10 acres, 120,000 square feet manufacturing facility. Wow. And we will we'll build most of it in-house. So we will start with the, the templates that get made by the engineering team. And those templates, or shapes as we call them, We'll go to the burn cables and we have two in-house burn cables they're 40 feet long they're capable of burning steel up to two inches thick and we'll cut that shape out and basically everything you see in a k-line trailer starts as flat plate and we'll take those flat plates and then we'll further work them so we have an in-house 
uh, brake press as well, we can form those, those plates. So you'll see on the box behind me there that it's got kind of a round formed section. And that's something we've done in our big brake press here. We've got the largest brake press on the west coast that we know of, and we can form those long sheets of plate and get them ready for fabrication. That I will say, Rob, that's another thing I just didn't realize when I, you know, when I was kind of doing my research at K-Line and then you started telling me about it. I, I didn't realize, I, I guess how would I, I was thinking more of it as an, an assembly. Let's say, so you, you know, you'd order these pieces. I mean, you're making I-beams in there. Yes. Uh, like, so I, 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 we're kind of jumping around in this interview, which is, I, I actually find fun because it sort of keeps me on my toes for the interview. <laughs> but um, how do you, I always think, okay, so you've got a customized team. Now you, you draw that out, it, the customer approves it. Now it goes into that someone's going to start building it. Yes. How often, there must be a lot of back and forth there too, because once it actually goes into getting it built, then you must get feedback from someone who's working on the press or the, 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 the cutting machine or whatever that says, well, this is how we'd have to do it to pull this specialized um, unit off. So is there back and forth afterwards or once it's going into the, the production, is it pretty um, set in stone? Good question, Jared. It's fairly set in stone at that point. Is it? That being said, I think K-Line has a unique environment here. We're all on the same team. And I think Les Knight really sets the tone here. He, you'll see Les at the factory and he'll be doing any number of jobs on a given day. So what I'm getting at is there's no, you know, engineering's here, administration's there, the shop's there. We all work together and collaborate. And so the shop will provide feedback to engineering. Engineering will provide feedback to the shop. And we really work on a team effort to get this product delivered. End of the day, the customer doesn't care, you know, who, who, whose fault it is if something goes wrong. So we all have to pull together to make sure we, we deliver the premium product. Yeah, the, you know, you said about like they'd, they'd have to either hire you or get a restraining order. And, <laughs> but there is there's something, and I don't know if you can explain it or, you know, it, it comes from the top down last night. And I know, I mean, Kelly Knight, who put, uh, she put the pictures together and helped yes. set everything up. She's the daughter of, of last night, I think, and the head of your marketing department. Is that right? Correct. And yeah. then David Knight, you just told me before the show started, he's the president. Correct. Yes. A family component. Um, but even when I, this was five years ago or so when I was there, just, I just did a walk around tour type thing. Yeah. And um, there, there is something that is different about your site. And I, I don't even, I'm not even hundred percent sure. Maybe you can <laughs> tell me, but there's an, there's a, for one, there's definitely a respect. There's a, there, there's certain, there's a certain manner, mannerism that I, I found when I went there. But then just the, the communication style and that, is that, where does that feed from? Is that, um, is that coming from how Les has approached and built the company? Absolutely, Jared. So when you phone K-Line, you're going to get a live person. Somebody will take your call and direct you to who you would like to speak to. We don't have a computer automated phone system here, and we've resisted that. Les Knight believes in the personal touch, and we've done many deals, some of them very high value, basically just on a gentleman's handshake agreement. We have the trust in, and the integrity in the industry. And furthermore, we've had our customers that come here and buy a trailer from us. They say, boy, that was the funnest experience ever. I really felt like part of the K-Line family when I was designing and, and, and building this trailer with you. So that's very unique. And that's something that I just love uh, working here. You know, and, and the thing that I would, that, that sort of leads me to is, a lot of times you will hear that sort of language from a company that's running maybe three or four people. Sure. This yeah. is okay, my trailer. Yes. So to spin off that, I want to go into some of these projects because I mean, some of the, the units you have built, I mean, some of the units there's, they're right behind you there, but let's get into a stuff, uh, a couple specific ones. Um, um, I'm going to let you take the lead on it, Rob. Are there a couple maybe in the aggregate sector that stand out for you that you sort of step back and look at that and go, that, that's a pretty amazing project that we pulled off. Yeah, Jared, good question. So as I mentioned, the transfer trailers, I love them. They're so unique and they're handcrafted here in our factory with our skilled aluminum welders. And, you know, we've got pretty good at them, I have to say, over the years. So they, they roll out the door and, and, and we build many of them. When we get into the bigger aggregate projects, 
is where engineering's more involved and I've, you know, I've been more involved in that in the last few years. So we can talk obviously about the big one on the wall behind me, the dual powered road train. And that's really the largest dump product that we have ever built here at K-Line. So the story goes that we had a customer in Northern BC here and they were hauling coal. They had a truck and they were trying to pull two 60 ton trailers hauling coal and they were having a hard time. You can imagine the roads up there get horrific in uh, 11 months of the year, I would say. <laughs> and they were just struggling to get these vehicles up the hill. We were all sitting in the boardroom and we were discussing with the customer, how can we get this payload moving more efficiently and get, get these trucks through the mud and up the hills? And somebody suggested, you know what would really work good? We need more traction. What if we put an engine in the trailer? And the room kind of went silent for a few minutes. And last night was in there and he said, let's do it. And that was the start of the K-Line dual powered road train. The latest one we built, you can see on the wall behind me, and it has an engine, transmission, drive axles in the trailer. You can see the fuel tanks there. And that's enabled the customer and our customers to really maximize their payload with, with one driver. So this one on the wall behind me, he's got 220 tons of payload, and it's just one driver behind the wheel. And Gowdy, there's a surprise on the show, is that we get to drive it. That would be awesome. <laughs> <laughs> no, <laughs> never will happen. Um, <laughs> um, people on the, that watch the show have heard me talk about like driving a forklift and stuff so that no one's ever going to touch So that, I mean, that, so had that been built before or like had someone else done this or um, like, like that's quite an engineering feat, especially, I mean, we're not, we're, we're talking millions of dollars worth of, I mean, we're talking lives people driving these machines we're yes. talking product in the machine we're talking the machines themselves um i mean what was that process it was extremely intense you can imagine designing building and and working through that process these trucks are huge as you you can well imagine they're over 11 feet wide they're off highway only uh, extremely large vehicles now you've all probably seen the australian road trains and these are a Canadian equivalent, I would say, to that. The, those serve a purpose in, in their region of the world. Ours are more suited for the northern climates and the, the harsh conditions we encounter there. The mines save an incredible amount of money, you can imagine, by, by maximizing their driver input up there. And it's just been a game changer in these mines where they've been operating. I, I, something that you, I think you said before, there's a, I think there's a, I'm going to have my notes here. It's, it was a bit of a collaboration, though, between this, right? This wasn't just, just a K-Line thing. You, you brought in, um, you collaborated with a couple companies to get these built, did you not? That's correct. Yeah, you, you'd be foolish to try and go all on your own on a, a project like this. Yeah. So we partnered with Caterpillar. They provided the engines. And, you know, the hardware is one thing. They also su supplied the support uh, to get it, obviously, uh, installed and, and working well in our application. We also worked with Allison Transmissions. We have an automatic Allison transmission in the trailer, the same one that's in the truck. And those two transmissions talk back and forth and, and work really in tandem and in sync with each other. And that's, that's critical here. The third partner was Western Star. And they worked with us very closely. You know, it's a team effort and their truck's at the front of the, the line there. And we needed each other to pull this off. So once you build something like that, and that that collaboration happens, I mean, I would I would love to be in some of those meetings, hearing hearing the the discussion. I can just imagine <laughs> what it's like. But okay. when you um, once you pull something like that, is it a one off? Is it one customer that needs that, or does that does that open a lot of the doors once it's it's proven that you can uh, produce that product? It, it, yeah, good question. And in this case, the customer bought multiple units. We built the prototype and then they came back for more. And so that really tells you the success right there. And then obviously the interest grows from that. As other minds see the success of this product, then other people are more apt to take on the technology as well. And so it's been, been a real uh, successful product for us. You know, it, it's just, it, it's absolutely just amazing. Um, then I want to, I do want to transition into the low beds a little bit, Rob, because that's, um, it, you'll probably correct me on this. That's probably the most common, you know, heavy, heavy long haul product I see out there. 
I come from a bit of a mining background, so I you, it's a lot of the equipment is hauled on these low beds. Yes, it is. Um, and I've again been the guy on the forklift loading some of those low beds, <laughs> and here and heard uh, some actually fairly intense discussions about where where it can sit on the trailer, how big it can be, can we get another motor on this load, you know, all that sort of stuff. It's kind of starting with you though, um, depending on what trailer that person ends up with on behind the tractor um what is that process is who's coming to you with these designs or are they coming with requirements or how does that process work on the low bed side yeah that's it's interesting each customer is unique some people will come to you and say i've got this machine to move it weighs x amount of pounds or so many tons how do i do it you know then we work through you know how many axles are you going to need what's this configuration going to look like but I'd say most of our customers already have a trailer and they've used it for years and it's time to update. And they've been behind the wheel a lot of hours with this truck and trailer. And now they've been doing some thinking and they want to make some changes. And they're interested in perhaps the way it performs, uh, the tear weight of it, the size of it, or the functionality. Everybody's striving to build that perfect trailer and it'll never be done as you can, you can imagine. So we're all, we're all building unique trailers for our unique customers. Um, on the on the low bed, okay. So, uh, par- pardon me, not just because I, I am a layman in this in this space. When you say something like super haul and specialized, do does that? How different is that from the low bed section? Are are, are specialized low beds, or is like do low beds have a stand a sort of a more standard design, or like a a haul ra- a haul range that they have, or a length range? What sort of separates those things out from a long haul and just a, a regular low bed? Good question. These are terms we throw around, and typically a low bed is going to haul machinery, so that'll be a cat, an excavator. Now sometimes they'll haul modules or buildings as well. And as you start moving away from hauling the yellow iron and into these bigger modular loads, that's when we get into specialized. So typically a low bed will stop that at about 85 tons. Uh, a thir- 13 axle combination is rated for about 85 tons and that's where the low beds typically stop and then we move into the specialized side. The highways department, they only allow so much weight per wheel or per axle on the road. So as you get these bigger loads, you know, you're only allowed about 20,000 pounds per axle. And the only way to do it, you got to have more axles, more, more trailer on the road. And so we'll get into some huge multi-axle configurations that just basically work to spread that weight out over a larger surface. I'm looking at one that, that Kelly was, was kind enough to put in it. I'm trying to count the axles quickly. It's got, <laughs> uh, there's six. There's another, I guess that's nine axles not including the, so um, I wanted, but these specialized ones, again, it's one of those things. It's like, Oh, you do specialized. So it's, it's more weight, but it's not just weight. You did. Um, didn't you do one that something about uh, uh, the, the gentleman, I think he had to go from, from over to Canada and then across the U S. So there was different permitting. So you needed to like make it. Um, I'll, I'll let you tell it. <laughs> okay. Thanks Jared. Yeah. There was a customer that I worked very closely with. And he had very unique requirements. He's the guy I've been talking about. He was behind the wheel many years, many hours, and was spent a lot of time away from his family as he traveled through the U.S. And the challenge in the U.S. is when you're empty, if you are not under 80,000 pounds and within legal dimensions, you have to basically get a permit for each state, maybe even every county. So he would find himself in a state and just not able to get home because he'd be waiting for daylight hours, waiting for these permits to come through. So his request to me was, I wanna have a big 13 axle, 85 ton trailer that can haul these crazy big loads. But once I deliver it, I wanna be able to stack this trailer all up and be eight foot six wide, legal length, and come in under 80,000 pounds. And then I can just zoom home uh, day or night, just like a normal highway tractor. And so this customer was very focused on what he needed. And, and that's what we appreciate too. He said, I want to be light. And then when we said, well, here's the lightest option, he said, let's do that. And we got there. We built this thing, came in under the weight that he was asking for. And he was just tickled that once he delivered his load, he could package this thing all up and just zoom on home again. That, um, so an example like that, is that, is that someone who's got one truck? He's, I mean, it's his 
that, that's how he makes his living just off that one unit. And, and but it's also in, kind of got it integrated into his lifestyle, essentially. Correct. Yes. He was an owner operator in this case. So there's two types of customers we have the owner operators who they're putting their personal skin in the game. They are buying this truck with their own funds and it's very personal to them. And as a previous driver, I know how important these units are to them. It's not just a piece of iron with wheels on it. This is a, a personal investment that is making a statement about our customer. The other customers we will see are the larger corporations. And they're not as interested in you know, the, the fine details of it. They want to typically haul payload and maximize their revenue. So it's two totally different goals. Uh, and yet the result is the same, that we custom build what each one wants. Over time, has it, um, has it shifted? Has it, is it become more corporate and, and then less of the, the single? Or, or are there still a lot of those owner-operator individuals who they're, they're designing and they need their specialty hall to sort of fit into, again, that lifestyle that they have? It's a great question. We, I, it goes two ways. So in the gravel side of things, we've actually seen a shift away from the large corporations and we're going to more owner operators that are buying their own personal gravel trucks and they're one off, two off type guys. The low bed side and the, the larger specialty side especially, it's very rare to see the owner ops anymore. As regulations get tougher, you can imagine it's very difficult for an owner operator to find his permits, maintain his truck, plan his routes, find the loads, all these things is, is challenging. And so we see a trend in that way towards these larger companies that are buying uh, low beds and specialty trailers. Right. So the, the owner operators, they do better if they're in a space where it's sort of that consistent grade of a material that they're moving or something like that, that they, yes. they can use the same. They don't need to have 10 different trailers. To That's roll. right. Right. Um, okay. So now we've got to jump into, uh, we'll call this the main feature because these, is, these are some crazy images that you have up. <laughs> um, you, where do the windmills come in in size? Now they're probably not the heaviest, right? They're 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 just they're just massive, <laughs> right? You got it. Yeah, they're a unique product to haul, and they require a very unique trailer. So these windmills, they started out they're only about ten thousand pounds. These windmills, but the problem is the length. As you can well imagine, they're in excess of one hundred and fifty feet long. The new ones coming out are getting much heavier. We're up to thirty to thirty five thousand pounds and over 200 feet long, if you can imagine these windmill blades. Also, they're very fragile. They're all made of fiberglass and honeycomb yeah. material. You can't just throw them on a, a trailer and chain them down like you could a, a cat or an excavator. So they really require a unique trailer that, that, that handles them carefully and, and a load securement is, is a big part of this trailer design so that we don't damage these blades. In order to house these, these blades on the trailers, we build a trailer that actually stretches or what we call trombones out. It'll be 53 feet long and have multiple sections where it opens up like kind of accordions out, if you will. And at the rear, we also have a full automatic steer system so that obviously you can get around the corners. And that's a, an automatic system that as they're going down the highway, the trailer responds to what the truck's doing and it will corner for the, for the driver. Mm. I, it's something I don't quite understand, Rob, is when someone comes to you and they've got a, they've got, I got a 200 uh, foot fiberglass, essentially wing that I got to take down a highway yep. um, across the country or wherever it's coming to and from. Um, do you, ha do they already have the permits and specifications or are you having to design it and then they take it for approval? What is that process that you have to go through or that they have to go through? Yeah, there's some commonality between Canada and the US as far as what's normally allowed. That being said, each region, each state is different and there's no way that we can know every intricacy of every state and county. So the customer generally is, is informed on that and we will work with them, but we rely on them to come to us knowing you know, what is the maximum weight they can haul per state as well there. But as a rule of thumb, typically in the US, it's about 20,000 pounds per axle. I see. Okay, so that's that's that is how it's done. It's per, per axle. But is there there must be is is there length restriction restrictions? I mean, obviously a thousand feet, it's not going to get approved. But yeah, it, what is is there a specific length that goes? Okay, we can't go over two hundred feet, and that limits the size of windmills that can get built. 
built unless you can be assembled the more like is there that kind of stuff or do you as a company do you just kind of not get involved with that it's surprising that the loads just get longer heavier larger every year and there's really not a capped limit where they say nobody shall exceed this somebody can always make a case that if we build this thing a little bit larger we're going to save money from having to assemble it in the field and they can if they can prove to the transportation ministers that we can safely get this down the road, then approval often comes after that. And we've been a, a part of a number of projects. Actually, we were the first ones to work in BC with our windmill trailers here. We worked very closely with our customer in Northern BC. And the government up there, the transportation uh, minister, was, was not sure how this was gonna work going down the road. So we worked with our customer and they set up a trial in Northern BC where they moved these windmill blades and demonstrated to the, the officials that yes, they are safe going down the road. And in fact, they corner quite well, there is no issues. Right. And from that, the permits were easy. So, so we're gonna see in a couple of years, we're gonna see 400 foot. Uh, yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, and I'll be stuck behind someone again. <laughs> no, so, um, I want to jump into a little bit, um, probably a good time to mention um, this, the, the uh, sorry, I lost my place here. Yeah, Rob, you, you've mentioned, um, I mean, trailers, axles, they kind of go hand in hand um, in every sense of the word. So I think this would be a good point in the interview. Um, we had KG Industries on the show. They were a sponsor of this episode. Um, and then there's this history, of, and Luke did a, Luke did a really nice interview. It's probably, probably honestly one of my highlights for the year because, you know, I don't want to push people to be personal on the show. Um, and he was willing to be, and, and, you know, talk about his, his father passing away and you know, him taking on KG Industries. But also on the show, we talked about there was a relationship that goes back to K-Line. Um, and and I, I don't want to clarify what that relationship is. It's sort of a nice history. And then actually that continues on right now. Yeah. Yeah, good question, Jared. I'd love to talk a little more about that. KG Industries is very similar to K-Line here. They're, we're both family-run and operated businesses, and there's actually a common history between the two companies. So years ago, when Les Knight was operating L. Knight & Company, he hired Al Genberg, and eventually Al became the v vice president uh, of operations there. Now, as time went on, they realized the need. They had to have their own axle manufacturing. And Al Genberg and Les Knight together started KG Industries. And that stood for Knight Genberg Industries. And so that's the history between Les Knight and Al Genberg. Now, obviously, today we need, as you mentioned, a lot of axles for our trailers. And we buy a lot of axles from KG Industries. And they're, they're like us, like I said, they're a family-run industry. And oftentimes we can phone them and say, we've got a demanding application. We have a tight time frame here and they can jump to the pump and get us the supplies we need quickly. The, the, something uh, I want to just touch on a little bit with a relationship like that, um, because I was on, on the interview, I was asking Luke about customer specifications. And then I'm asking you about when customers come in. Yeah. So there's this supply chain that happens. Yeah. So again, when you're going to a company like that, now you need a specialized piece of um, piece of gear for your product for mm -hmm. the customer that's got a specialized gear to move their yeah. product. Are you coming with pretty specific requirements or are you saying this is the thing that we need to have happen? Can you design it for us? How would that type of relationship work? Yeah, it's, it's both ways. Sometimes it's just, hey, take this axle we've ordered before. Maybe we want to change the length of it. And other times it is, hey, we need to think outside the box here. We need a different way to activate perhaps the steering system on the axle or, or, or new, new brake technology. And KGI has been very responsive and, and very willing to, to partner with us in that. Yeah, it's, um, it's, it's kind of a neat thing. You know, you say it's still family, family run and, and you know, there's family involved in both, both companies. And, um, and what I found with, we've, I think we're actually going to start a, a, a transportation show in the new year and there is a multi-generational thing that's happening within the transportation sector <laughs> yeah because <laughs> everybody it's like these there's something about the industry that's quite interesting um and it's it's one of these 
I don't, there's no industry that covers as much ground, physical ground as the transportation sector. And out of all the industries, I don't think there's been one that's more intertwined where everybody knows everybody, everybody's working with it. Am I imagining that or is that a real thing? It's a very real thing, Jared. I, you know, I don't want to name our competitors' names, but many of the people that started those companies at one time worked uh, with or, or, or alongside uh, last night here. And it's just a, it's a family, uh, it's a small, close-knit group of people, I guess, that are in the, in the trailer industry. We all know each other for sure. Well, I guess the other thing it comes down to is you don't want a thousand different people um, building trailers that are going 100 clicks down the, uh, down the highway with 20,000 pounds per axle. There's a lot of responsibility to do the job, first of all, on time, do it on budget, but number one, do it safely, absolutely. Yeah, that's right. And um, so when did, so that was started in 67, and then I know you mentioned it already, but Les, Les started K-Line K in, um, when did you say again? 1994. 94. And when he started that, was that, was it a trailer manufacturer right off the, off the it, it did what it did today, just and continued on with it? Correct. I should mention as well, Les Knight started K-Line with, with Alex Ma, and Alex and Les have worked together over 40 years now. Alex has, has backgrounds in engineering, and he was the general manager of K-Line before myself. Oh, I see. Those two have tag-teamed, and they started K-Line Trailers in 94. And it right off the bat, it was transfer trailers, it was low beds and specialty, and working for for the customer whatever their needs are yeah it's i mean it's an amazing facility it's so it's hard on these interviews because um you can't it's hard to capture i mentioned if we ever do this again i, I yeah. would love to do it at your facility because it's it's one of those things it's a it's almost a culture that you it's very difficult to capture i think you've done a nice job of it but um there is something about that i i again i can't quite put my finger on it but there is something about it there and um one thing that I was wondering too, Rob, is you've now moved into the GM position. And you mentioned before, it's kind of everybody's doing a little bit of everything. So how much has your role changed? Are you still involved in the design or, or how do you sort of, how does that shift when you take on that new role? Yeah, it's been interesting, Jared. It's, we all wear a lot of hats at K-Line. We're a, a small company in terms of, you know, we're not multinational. And, and as such, we have a lot of roles to fulfill. And so a typical day for me is, is interesting. I might be on sales in the morning and then I'll be talking with our production team in the afternoon, planning how to do different projects, then working closely with engineering, maybe some HR. It's, it all kind of mixes together as you can imagine. But at the end of the day, our goal is just to produce the best trailer we can for our customer. And I'll do whatever it takes to make that happen, whether it is sales related, whether I gotta you know, step in and help out with engineering for a little bit, uh, and that's the unique thing about K-Line is we don't have these hard to find roles like you might see in other companies. But how do you also, um, when something is being customized, I mean, there's opinions. Every, if people are passionate about what they're doing, they're also going to be passionate right. about what they're bringing and their opinion and how they see it and their expertise, not just an opinion. Yeah. So how do you, as you're sort of moving these projects forward? And again, I mean, these are not, you're not talking something that's sitting, sitting on a shelf. You're talking, I mean, there's, people's lives yes <laughs> at stake. these things yes. are going down the highways and off-road there's yeah. millions of dollars in product at stake i mean these are these are high profile big moves that people are doing with your product so how do you get everybody going and i know you mentioned last night um how he's so the culture he's brought and i've talked to kelly and you know so i see it but but just for you yourself how do you get five or six people in a room all this expertise, all this knowledge, these opinions, and get everybody going in the same direction to, to get the end result? Good question. And it's hard to understand. It just happens. It's our culture here. We have a can-do attitude, and we really the, let the customer dictate the design and, and whatever his opinion is, how he wants to build something, we run with that. And we don't try to talk him into, you know, perhaps a design that's easier for us to build or something we've done already I mean obviously that's what we would like to do but if the customer wants to you know color outside the lines a bit we entertain that and everybody at K-Line understands that that's that's our job and that ultimately if the customer is successful we're going to be successful and we've seen numbers of times how you know we have these 
almost impossible deadlines or, or tasks to do, and yet we can all pull together and it just, may, it just happens and it comes out the other end just right. And I watch these TV shows, you know, they have to get a car designed or something in a week for a show. And, and I kind of laugh at that. We all have 20 projects like that all happening concurrently. And our purchase, purchasers madly trying to, you know, order parts for it. Engineering's working on it as well. And the shop's doing their part. And it all comes together. And it's really just an amazing process to be a part of. When, when and, and dovetailing to that is you, we were, we were talking about, you know, a, you, I said, will there be 400? I was kind of being tongue in cheek. And you said, yes, there are, are going to be 400 foot going down the road. Is that, um, there is a, you mentioned, um, and I'll just quickly get you to do it again so that I, I get it right. I, uh, you have a, the, the machines, what are the, the main components you have? Um, and then I want to talk a little bit about sort of how you, you go about, um, th those investments. Cause there's some major investments that K that K line has made. Um, let's talk about the, uh, you've got a couple here. What are those two main, there's two main giant pieces that you have that you already mentioned. So uh, as far as production machinery, you're, you're, yeah, you're that's right. yeah. yeah. so we tend to do a lot in house, maybe to a fault, but we found Jared that, you know, you can sometimes send things out of house to get the, the shapes made or perhaps the steel burned or the machining is done. And it's, sometimes it's not just about the economics of it. But the time frame is, is always a challenge in custom trailer building. And having that machinery in-house gives us the capability and the flexibility to, to deliver the product on time. So the, the two biggest pieces of uh, production machinery, uh, I may expand it into three, but the first one we'll start with is the burning tables. So we've got two in-house 40 feet long burn tables that enable us to go from you know, engineering design to cut steel shapes very rapidly. And, and that's that there are state of the art machines. We've got bevel heads on them. So we can actually bevel cut the steel and, and put a profile on it as we're cutting it. Once the shapes are cut out, typically the next part of the process is, is metal forming. And that's, I, I touched on it earlier. We have this large brake press. It's an 1800 ton brake, ta brake press. So, you know, numbers get bounced around. Okay, 1800, that sounds like a lot. But imagine a piece of steel 20 feet long three quarters of an inch thick. We can put that piece of steel into the machine. It can come down and bend a 90 degree profile onto that piece of plate. So once we've done that forming, it just prevents us from having to you know, weld that whole section. We can form it and it's a stronger, cleaner joint being part of that formed metal. The next part of our production that I would want to touch on is our rail shop. Now, just about every trailer we build has rails on it. Now, What's a rail? It's basically a, a fancy word for an I-beam. Yeah. We all are familiar with I-beams. You've got your two flanges and a web joining them. Every trailer we build has rails and we have our own in-house rail shop. And the heart of that process is a machine that last night built actually when he started K-Line and it's our, our custom rail, um, rail welding, beam welding machine. And that enables us to build these extremely strong custom beams for each trailer. <laughs> I, I, I was thinking again. I re, relating it back to my own <laughs> my own work out in the field. Um, what? How, how long does it take before you'll let the rookie uh, grab the handles of one of those machines? <laughs> Good question, Jared. It, it's probably not the first day. Put it that way. And and we've learned over the years. You know, buying the machine is the easy part, and anybody who's run a business knows that. Whether you buy a a, a truck or an excavator, uh, you know, or that sort of thing, you buy the machine but it really takes the key operator to operate it. And we work very hard to find the right personnel to run these machines. And we also have a very extensive in-house training program. And we have numerous success stories. We could do a whole show on, you know, how we've taken an individual who started here, you know, with, with very little skill set, and now they're in key management roles within the company. So we really have a, a great in-house training program and, and really build up our people. When you set up something like the breaker, though, is that, um, is that uh, I mean, just bringing those, those products in and, and, and setting it up is, is one thing. Now, is there someone that you have to bring in that, is, does, that knows how to do it? Or do you have someone that just is good with that type of thing? I mean, that first, the first time you start bending something that, that thick and that heavy, I mean, that's, a, that's no small feat and, and not a small investment. 
um, you know, you're not a, you're not a small company, but you're also not, a, like you said, a multi global corporation. So yeah. that's a big investment. Um, and now you've got someone that's about to pull the lever on a giant piece of steel in the middle of your warehouse. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You got to have trust in your personnel. And we, so when we did buy that big brake press, as you can imagine, we had the team that, that uh, came over to assemble it for us. They set it all up and they got it going and we gave them a drawing and said, okay, show us what it can do. And they proceeded to form this steel. And I got to admit, it didn't come out very well. And we just thought, oh, what have we done? But again, we put the right person on the job. We hired the key people to run it with experience in the industry. And I'll tell you, they can make that thing dance. There's always a, a, a few secrets to everything and they can do miracles with that machine that uh, any computer system could not do. I mean, it is a computerized machine, but still it relies on the people to, to know just exactly what to do. Would that machine, would that, would it be safe to say that machine gets used on every product? Like, is it just in continual work or, or do some products, do they not, is it more about forming I-beams? I, I just, I see these round, a lot of the round shapes that you have in that. So is that pretty much every product um, that you put out the door has that machine? Typically the truck boxes are, are used. Uh, we use the brake press more for the truck bodies, I should say. Uh, you'll see the round shapes of the truck bodies and that's primarily where we use the machine. Uh, that being said, we'll use it on heavy uh, low beds and specialized trailers as well. It's, it's, uh, Again, Rob, I, I, uh, I've kind of mentioned a couple times, and I, I don't know if I can do um, K-Line uh, justice um, through this format. I, I'm, I've, I've tried, and Kelly was, was so good about putting pictures together. So, you know, you and I aren't seeing it in the interview, but during this interview, a lot of pictures are going to be showing up so people undergo, uh, see the scope of what you're doing. It yeah. really is amazing, and it's, it's fun for me too because a lot of our guests now are coming – of course, we have a huge audience in the U.S. We love we love working with the American companies, but it's really nice when I get to have a guest on. It's it's such a success story, um, and it's and it's you actually see it. You see K line trailers everywhere um, over yep. here in BC, so it's nice to have someone who's just thirty minutes away um, on the show. It's, it's so so. Thank you for coming on. Thank you, Kelly, for setting everything up. And and Rob, sort of. Uh, you know, people just see the interview, but there's a lot, we've been back and forth preparing stuff, what we're going to talk about. And so thanks for putting in the time to do this interview with us. Thank you, Jared. It's a tremendous opportunity. And we thank you for having us on our show today. Okay. Um, Gowdy, uh, are you going to go get your license so you can drive one of those? Uh... Yeah, do it. <laughs> <laughs> I, honestly, from the entire yeah, time. Yeah, you want, interview, the, you want the breaker. You want to run that thing. <laughs> I think I'm, I'm ready to see you go into K-Line and, and, and apply for a job just so you can. <laughs> but I will get the actual restraining order put against <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, Gowdy, uh, thank you everybody for watching. Gowdy, where can people find, follow, and by the way, thank you everybody for all the, the guests that you're suggesting. We are, um, we are basically putting out shows as fast as we can do them now. Yes. Um, and that's, that's because of people suggesting uh, guests because we, of course, can't reach out to everybody. So keep doing that. And Gowdy, where can people follow, like, comment, or tell us how we can do uh, a better job? Um, well, please go and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Again, there is an episode there pretty much. Actually, there's about two episodes a week. Um, definitely check that out. Follow us on Facebook and LinkedIn at Transman Key. Um, you can listen to the podcast um, pretty much everywhere: Spotify, uh, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts. Again, everywhere. <laughs> uh, I thought we were going to do all twenty. <laughs> uh, no, I, I don't think I can. <laughs> I don't. I, I don't think I can do that. Um, uh, what else? Uh, no, and thank you. Yes, thank you for uh, suggesting guests. If you'd like to be a guest or want to uh, suggest a guest, uh, contact us, info at Crownsman P. Again, that's whether it's the Crownsman Show, Mining Now, or Crownsman Energy. And thank you to our sponsors. Yes, absolutely. It, uh, it's, it's a huge help um, to a small organization like ours. Um, of course, we try to give good value. But it's always appreciated, you know, when, com when these great companies are sponsoring and companies like K-Line are coming on to engage our audience. Yes. Uh, thanks again, Rob, for coming on. Thanks for watching, everybody. We will see you on the next episode of The Crownsman Show. <laughs>